Almighty God, uh, touch my lips, inspire my heart, and may we all receive some of your grace that my words aren't just my words. Heaven forbid that we all may gain inspiration from your scriptures today. Uh, the road, where does the road lead? That's a beautiful picture. I believe that is the road of Emmaus. It's a, certainly a Roman road in the Middle East. Absolutely enchanting. It looks like a, it's extraordinary. Well, anyway, what I'm going to do before I actually start preaching is give you some background on the text I'm preaching from. Although I'll be touching upon the road to Emmaus, I'm going to be preaching on the, the epistle, the first epistle to Peter, 1 Peter. Um, and we made sacrifices so that we could have 1 Peter today. If any of you read the uh, e blast no, I didn't mean that to sound sarky, like, if any of you read the e blast this week, <laughs> what I mean is, if you read the e blast this week, you'll see that it had a devotional and an exposition on uh, Zephaniah. Because we had to forego Zephaniah and the lectionary in order to be able to get one piece. Mm -hmm. So there you go. <laughs> Sacrifices! Uh, it meant that I actually had to write a sermon during the week on Zephaniah. Because I hate to see these things go past unexplained, you know? Uh, if there's a scripture which is presented, then let's have some thought on it. Let us delve into it. Let us uh, uh, drink from it and feed from it. So Zephaniah was open to me again. Anyway, I'm not preaching on Zephaniah, it's about a letter, isn't it? So, the letter that we know today as 1 Peter was accepted as being one of the uh, authoritative uh, parts of the New Testament really early on. Uh, Polycarp, who was one of those uh, old gentlemen with beards, uh, who you get in the early church, and who the early church often turns upon, uh, quoted from this letter in about 130 AD. Now, when we consider that most of the New Testament wasn't done and dusted and settled for another 100, 150 years after that, um, then this was considered authoritative really early on. So what he did was, he quoted this letter in a letter he wrote to the Philippians. Now, you can't quote from a letter unless you're pretty sure, or reference a letter unless you're pretty sure that the people you're writing to know what you're talking about. So this gave us some idea that this had been disseminated throughout the Christian community pretty early on. Um, it seems also, due to historical and literary references, that it was probably written uh, about 80 to 100 AD, which is much earlier than its, its following uh, book. So it was written really on, uh, early on. We're still in the kind of um, aftermath of all the events that happened in the 30 years or so after the death of Jesus, you know. The sack of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, very, very fresh in the mind of whoever wrote 1 Peter. We don't really know who wrote it. Uh, it has the most beautiful Greek in the New Testament. It is effectively the Shakespeare of the New Testament. It has been seemed unlikely by uh, biblical uh, experts that a probably illiterate uh, fisherman from uh, the Sea of Galilee, who probably had no Greek, who would have spoken in Aramaic, who would have had no access to the um, uh, Septuagint, which is the Hebrew Testaments in Greek, and they're quoted a lot in this one Peter. It seems unlikely that such a person would have written this book. That being said, the likelihood is that it came from the circle of Peter. Um, those followers and evangelists who were with him. Now, when we say things like that, what we're saying is not that this book is in any way less valuable than it was uh, if it was written by the Apostle Peter. Uh, what we're saying is that we can gain a little more insight into the circumstances in which it was written, and therefore we can look more truthfully on the book. Um, because truth must always be our final objective. Not the confirmation of things that we <coughs> believed we knew, uh, not the confirmation of tradition, which can be very comforting, um, but truth. Truth is our objective. And sometimes we have to make sacrifices for truth. Uh, comfort and stability are often sacrificed for truth. People have sacrificed their lives for truth. Christians have sacrificed their lives for truth. Uh, 
uh, for 2,000 years. Um, and it is one of those things that we will be called to do. Uh, but truth gives a new sort of security, a new sort of solidity. So, having said this, and having said that it's unlikely that Peter uh, wrote this, what does this mean? Well, as I said, very little when it comes to actually looking at the text and being fed by it, and our openness to be fed by it. Uh, and why am I preaching on this latter instead of the road to Emmaus? The road to Emmaus is a famous story that we've been through today. Now, all of us know, presumably, about the road to Emmaus. I mean, there are books written called Emmaus on spiritual development. Um, it's the road to Emmaus moment, like the road to Damascus moment that people have. Uh, it's when you realize that something which you took for granted uh, is something extraordinary. It's another transfiguration. It's another one of those occasions where God in Jesus Christ reaches into uh, the way that humans look at the world and tweaks it, opens our eyes, and the gauze falls away, and all of a sudden we realize that we've been in the presence of glory all along. Now that's a especially breathtakingly beautiful uh, story and metaphor and reality when we read it into the road to Emmaus, but it is, of course, our daily reality. We can find ourselves correcting ourselves and pulling away the gauze on an hourly basis in our lives because any of us who believe that we are not surrounded by glory is strikingly and terrifyingly mistaken. We are always and everywhere surrounded by glory. Uh, and the transfiguration that happened on the road to, Emma to Emmaus is our birthright. Um, the fact that we often have to do it several times uh, is neither here nor there. It's the sort of thing that you can do a thousand times and we are still gathered into God. We are still greeted by Jesus on the road, uh, even when we have no idea that it was Jesus for the first 50 years of our lives. Yeah. Or 44 in my case. <laughs> I'm going to get my driving license out and prove it to <laughs> Do you know, some people, when they tell people their age, everyone politely says, oh, I never would have believed you were that age. <laughs> and when I tell people my age, you see surprise in their eyes, but not for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, anyway, so the road to Emmaus is a theophany. We were talking about this in Bible study. It's a theophany, an outshining of God, a revelation of God, God in Jesus Christ. And uh, it's all the more uh, potent to us because it's a journey. This journey is occurring symbolically to the village of Emmaus and in reality. Um, and we ourselves are on a journey and we are co-journeying with Christ. And there comes a point whereby the glory hits us. And if there doesn't come a point where the glory hits us, well, we look for the glory. If you don't find something presented to you, you've got to look for it, haven't you? Uh, and a lifetime striving for that is a life well worth lived. You know, <laughs> it's the pearl beyond price. It's the reason why you would sell everything you had and buy the field that contained the pearl. We are on a journey as well. But the reason why I'm not preaching about this, because I'm not preaching at the moment, this isn't preaching, <laughs> um, is because I preach about it every week. It is my vocational um, apex, if you like. It is the uh, unique thing that I feel I have to share, is that transfiguration. Because for me, it's been utterly transformative. It's changed my life. It's pulled me out of the miry clay at times when I believed that all was miry clay. And it's, it's shown that uh, there was no miry clay. I was in the midst of God's glory in creation. The miry clay I had produced myself and packed around my legs. And I defended it to all comers. And I used that miry clay as an excuse as to why I couldn't do things. Why I needed special treatment and looking after and all the other various things. 
So that's my daily bread. That's my weekly message. Transfiguration to me is everything. All it is is a glimpse of reality. And then afterwards, our life in God is, is gradually cleaving closer and closer to reality. Because the one thing that can't be redeemed when we die is fantasy. The one thing that doesn't pass beyond the grave is fiction. So our joy and our task and our life is to ensure that our lives are not just fantasy and fiction, that there is something left to enter the presence of God. <coughs> Damn, where did that come from? <laughs> I didn't write that down. <coughs> well, it doesn't look like we're going to get to one, Peter, does it? <laughs> oh, sure. <coughs> Let's have a look at the meat of the text. And that will stop me going off on tangent. But that was a tangent which I will return to, trust me. That was the nub of an issue which I've been thinking about for the past 15 years. So we're definitely going to hear more than that. Make sure I don't forget it between now and then. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's true. It's a strange thing. Now, you're going to think I'm superstitious about this. But let's be honest, it's a healing service so I can talk superstitious. I can be Pentecostal if I want. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Be noisy, Thank church. You. All right. Yes. Yeah. The thing is, Dolores Berry told me, and I think I've told you, that when she gives a reading to somebody, Dolores Berry is a saint of God in her denomination, if you don't know her. She's an extraordinary woman, a gospel <laughs> singer, and she is, uh, well, is she a prophet? Is she a medium? Yes. What is she? She has many different things. She sees things which um, other people wouldn't see. Uh, and she sees things which may be just in your memory. Um, and she sees them. So I don't know how to pigeonhole her. But what she says is that when the spirit moves, and she is in that moment of speaking to the person, and she's inside their aspirations and their spirit, and in a relationship with God, within three minutes she's forgotten everything she says to now, when I preach and my sermon goes out of the window and I feel like I am transported in the spirit, I don't remember a blasted thing I've preached. And I go back and I look at the video and I will be edified and I'm watching it as if anybody else is watching it. You know, it's extraordinary business. Anyway, that wasn't what I was talking about. Um, one Peter. <coughs> If you invoke as father, mother, Abba, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. Now what does fear mean in this context? That's a dramatic statement. That's a dramatic statement because we all invoke as father or parent uh, the one who judges all people impartially. Each and every one of us invoke them. <coughs> him, her, when we come into this place. Um, uh, what are the implications of that to us? Okay, we're invoking it. That means that we are looking for the judgment that God gives. That is the truthful judgment. The judgment that sees the intent of the heart and does not see the symptom, doesn't see the outworking of it. Uh, that sort of judgment that doesn't see uh, the broken glass and the wine all over the floor and get mad, but sees uh, you having a spasm and your hand flying and, and the glass being broken. That's a really poor metaphor, but you know what I mean. <laughs> that sees the cause, not just the symptom. So if we're going to invoke that sort of judgment upon us because we give it to ourselves, we judge ourselves by our motivations and everyone else by their uh, behavior, um, despite the fact that we understand in ourselves that the two things are completely different. If we're going to seek that from God, then that carries a heavy burden of responsibility. A burden of responsibility which means that we should live in reverent fear. Mm -hmm. Fear meaning awe during the time of our exile, our exile, our, our life on earth, our life in this, whatever you want to call it. It's a veil of tears for some at some point. Um, but our exile in this life, we are called upon to have a reverent fear that the claim we make upon God must also be given to others. Which means that if we are asking Almighty God to judge us, then we must also understand that we have no place in judging others. Now, that means 
no place. That means that one of the struggles of our life as Christians is learning not to judge. Now, that's not a decision that happens overnight, but it is a way of living, you know. What you dwell upon eventually becomes you. Uh, your repeated thoughts eventually become part of you. They work their way back into your soul. Instead of being just exterior expressions like, oh, God, I'm bored. They become things that, that fall back upon yourself and start to change you. So if we spend every day frustrated and angry about <coughs> immigration, for example, and devaluating the humanity of people who immigrate, then we start to change. That changes us. It starts to change the very sort of person, the sort of soul that we are. Now that can happen in a positive way as well. So if I think about the whole issue of judgment and the fact that we've called upon this God to judge us impartially, then you become a creature of virtuous habit. You can correct yourself. It is possible to counter these thoughts when they come up. You see someone in the street and you dismiss them as being less than human because, I don't know, they're wearing something ridiculous, they're, they're heavy set, they're trapped, whatever the reason. You can correct that. You do have a role in editing your own thoughts, in editing your own behavior, and gradually over time, and nobody knows this like me, believe you, Gradually, over time, it comes to change you. Change changes the very core of you. So my grandmother was one of these saintly, extraordinary women who I uh, found very irritating when I was a child. She wouldn't, if you said that you hated something, she would become very agitated. And uh, she couldn't stand the thought of such an ugly thought in the head of one that she loved. That was the truth of it. It hurt her to think that such a lovely thing as she saw me when I was a little boy. When I was a little boy, I was a lovely thing. <laughs> With blonde hair and little, you know, flicks coming up and blue eyes and, yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would behoove you not to look so shocked. Um, <laughs> I've seen pictures of you as a younger man with the dog with the long hair, yes, looking glamorous. Um, <laughs> yes, quite. Anyway, Grandma would um, would never allow us to say these things. She would defend everybody. She would never appear for the prosecution. She irritated myself. She irritated my father, and especially my mother, because my mother had a had a sort of movement towards being slightly negative in those days. You know, we're talking about the 1970s, 80s here. Um, and I, at the time, just didn't understand it. Uh, to me, well, I just expressed what I felt at the time. That was an end of it. Well, I hated that person. They'd be mean. Uh, Grandma would say, well, now, why were they mean, Clinton? Uh, why were they mean? She, oh, Clinton, they just mean. No, that wasn't it. They were mean. Maybe their mommy was cruel to them this morning, she'd say. <laughs> and it got me thinking. Um, and I started filtering. Um, and I'm still pretty mean, but I'm an awful lot better than I used to be. So, I am living testimony that at least some progress is possible. Some progress is possible. Amen. And natures can be adapted relative to where they started. But uh, God is good, and uh, you pour enough kindness into your own heart, and you start to change. Uh, and kindness is unlimited. You don't get, you don't run out of it. It's a, I know it's a weak and feeble word, but kindness is something which is transformative to whole societies. Um, absolutely, very strong. Now here I go. You know that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Now this is a this is a difficult one, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Well, evoking imagery of the blood of Christ is a deeply and profoundly unfashionable thing to do um, in churches across the board, not just in MCCs, but in MCCs, I mean, 
once upon a time you could almost be shot dead in the pulpit for uh, mentioning the blood of Christ. Um, well, it's Passover imagery, uh, of course. It, uh, lifting up the power of Jesus' blood for a reason. Uh, because it's blood shed of flesh, uh, shed in the redemption of the cross, proof of love's passive victory. Remember last week when we talked about Julian of Norwich, uh, when I talked at length about Julian of Norwich, uh, love's passive victory over the hatred that only hours before stood triumphant. The blood is a symbol of that, because the flesh was put to death by, as Julian would say, sin, we might say cruelty, evil, uh, hatred, all these different things. Um, and in that moment, love was victorious. Yes. Uh, not a schmaltzy, romantic love, but the sort of love that is willing to be hammered to a cross for others. If there was no blood, there was no real person there. If there was no blood, there was no human being involved. God robed in flesh is nothing but a fond fantasy. The blood, therefore, has been very important for many generations of Christians. And that shouldn't be lightly set aside just because we might get a bit squeamish. Blood in all its forms is a precious life force uh, from the feminine side and on the masculine side. Blood is an extraordinary and potent uh, symbol. So, the final verse, uh, verses of our reading today are extraordinary. Now that you have purified your souls by your adherence to the truth, your obedience to the truth, so that you have guided genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. <coughs> we attend here every week, most of us. Um, and it's easy to be distracted by the nice things that happen, uh, the social aspects, um, the music, uh, which is part of our worship, um, and sometimes hard questions like where we see our spiritual life going can get put on the back burner. Do we really see ourselves as being in a state of flux, in a state of progress, or do we see ourselves as having found a place of comfort which sustains us as we are and continuing on that. Because I have to tell you, you are all in a state of progress, whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, and if you don't accept it, and if you don't feed it, you will start to suffocate. Because you are moving. You are using your spiritual energies. And if you don't believe you're moving, moving you will not feed yourself appropriately, and you will starve. And then you will wonder why you're coming to church, because you don't get any blessing from it. You will wonder why your lives at home are not changed, because you get no blessing from it. Because there is no progress going on. There is no breaking apart of the human heart and allowing new things in. None of this is happening, and therefore we start thinking, well, where am I going? Why am I bothering? You know, I could do something else. Well, if it wasn't for the reality of God, yes, you could. But guess what? The almighty, omnipotent, all-powerful, and all-loving creator of the heavens and earth is an undeniable, extraordinary reality. It governs all of our lives. It is central to all of our lives. Ignoring it will not make it go away, brothers and sisters. You are going to be spending an awful lot more time with that unknowable, almighty God than you are ever going to spend with your friends down at the golf course, or the tennis course, or a bingo. Amen. Come on. Time invested with that unknowable, almighty, all-loving God is the only thing worth investing in. Because it will sustain you through an eternity. We have to be sure that we can get to the truth of our identity as human beings, and as Christians, and our relationship to God. Otherwise, as I say, what are we bring to the grave but fantasy? Well, do you know, fantasy can go into the grave, but it stays in the grave. Yes. It is only our souls and our personhood that can soar angelic into the arms of God. And therefore, truth is more than just a small thing. Truth is everything. Everything. 
the fun stories we tell ourselves are not harmless. They are distracting us from the truth. The truth is not painful. Any pain we feel is because we are cutting off something which is useless to us. The truth is always in the long term, redemptive. It is always compassionate. It is always loving. And it is our adherence to, our obedience to the truth, as the text says today, that will give us that genuine mutual love to one another, love one another deeply from the heart. I'm going to close in a minute. Maybe not then. <laughs> but that mutual love from the heart. Okay, I know we have coping methods. We have people in church we find difficult. We have all these different things, but never be under the illusion that those prevent love. They don't. My mother loves me. She loves me desperately. She finds me extremely annoying much of the time. <laughs> love and annoyance are not mutually exclusive. In fact, it's very unlikely that you genuinely love someone if they never annoy you. Because love brings a care for their well-being, a care about where they're going. So they're going to irritate you because you think that they're doing something which is going to be bad for them. So, okay. There's this extraordinary uh, writing, which was written for a community that was feeling increasingly exiled. It was feeling exiled because of the way it did things, because of its love, because of its adherence to the truth. It was feeling exiled from both sides, from the Jewish community, from the Gentile community. And that growing feeling of exile was worrying and disturbing the Christians to whom the author was writing. Well, we are exiles. We are increasingly becoming exiles, and it is right that we should be exiles, but we are loving exiles. We are not disapproving and distant exiles. We are exiles amidst because there are certain things that we hold to which are going to make us peculiar and unusual. Apart from the obvious things. Um, <laughs> there are things which we are called upon to do as Christians. Um, that extraordinary love, that rejection of all judgment, which are going to make us stand out like a sore thumb. I find my Facebook friends are winnowing down so rapidly at the moment uh, it's untrue. <laughs> it's just seems that there was a whole burn of, of hateful, passive-aggressive comment coming out there. And I thought, I don't, no, ah, that's it. <laughs> don't need it. Because that will infect me. That will pollute me. I engage in that in other than a one-to-one -one setting, where I can honestly take it to task, then that will impinge upon my life in a negative. So we are exiles, um, and that's no bad thing. But it is love that is our salvation, and it's our obedience to love that puts us in a position of being exiled. It's love that drives people across the world. It drove me across the world to a completely different country. Love drives people sometimes from family and from the normative ideas of their society, is it? makes them stick their neck out so far that they fear it's going to be cut off, and sometimes it is. It is love that can heal any wound, and it is love that has healed all wounds. Past, present, and future tense. As I say, not a wet, romantic notion, but a mighty and glorious, universe-straddling <coughs> reality that leaves its negative, its lack. Remember that all hatred and evil is just the lack of as nothing but a void which is automatically filled in the presence of love. We may find we are called to be other, but we will model God's love amongst ourselves, and the tremendous consequences of that task will occupy our years, all of our years, and this our exile.